Let's go to Serbia now, where tensions are rising. Serbian media reports this evening say that special police troops have taken control of two checkpoints on the border between Kosovo and central Serbia, a violation of current agreements. Uh, Russia says they are alarmed at this aggression and say that the West is pushing for a direct conflict uh, in Serbia. For more on that, we want to bring in Serbian journalist Tesha Novic, who is joining us from Belgrade, Serbia. Tesha, great to have you here on the show from one of my favorite cities in the world. Um, can you bring us up to speed on what happened specifically on these checkpoints? But it sounds like there's a ratcheting up of tensions over the past few days. Oh, well, thanks for having me on your show. What we have been witnessing in these days is basically the breakdown of the mutual agreements between the government of Serbia and the government of so-called Kosovo that were signed in Brussels in 2014. These agreements were part of the EU, EU uh, United Union, uh, European Union effort to normalize the relations between the Kosovo and Serbia in order to bring and integrate this whole region into the Euro-Atlantic uh, political sphere. Uh, those agreements uh, came at a cost from Serbian side. Serbia has decided to give up on the par so-called parallel structures in Kosovo, how the Western media called them, and that means the state institutions that were controlled by the Serbian central government in the territory of Kosovo. In return, the government in Pristina was supposed to found the so-called uh, the Union of the Serb Municipalities. That would be some kind of a Serbian autonomy between Kosovo. But so far, ever since uh, 2014, uh, there was a standstill on that point. Nothing was done. Uh, Pristina is uh, refusing to implement its part of the, those mutual agreements. And now there is a disagreement regarding the license, uh, uh, car registration license plates. Uh, the reason why the Albanian side from Pristina doesn't want to implement the uh, points of the mutual agreement that were uh, that were kind of a compromise from this side is because they want to save those as a pressure point towards Belgrade. And I think that the reason why is this going on now is not uh, coincidental. It's uh, connected to the, as you know yourself, to the spillover effects of the war in Ukraine and to the fact that Serbia hasn't imposed uh, sanctions on Russian Federation. So that's really interesting. So yes, Serbia, anyone who's been watching for our show for any length of time knows that we've been following this very closely, what's been happening in Russia. And Serbia, of course, has taken a, a very, I want to say neutral position. I don't know if that's the right word, but they are not implementing sanctions despite what Germany has wanted. I mean, heck, all, Chancellor Olaf Scholz flew to, to Serbia to meet with uh, to meet with Serbian President Vucic and basically say, we want you to implement sanctions against Russia. They said no. Instead, they've made gas deals with with Vladimir Putin to make sure that the Serbian people are taken care of during this winter, which we've praised here on this show, saying, well, imagine that someone taking care of their own people uh, during these times. You see what's happening throughout the rest of Europe. And so do you think that this is sort of NATO retribution, uh, picking on Serbia, forcing Serbia's hand here because they will not implement sanctions against Russia? Yeah, of course, it's a part of the hybrid warfare against the countries that have their own sovereign will and that are pursuing their own foreign policy and not just following blindly the orders of Washington. And as a part of the uh, so-called, uh, as a part of the pressure, they have the so-called strategy of the tension. As you know yourself, uh, they will create these small incidents. Uh, 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 what I have to say to the audience, uh, this thing might be solved in a day or two, and I believe it will be solved in a day or two. Because the goal of the West at this point, and by West I mean the deep state, isn't really to create an armed conflict. It is just to set up this micro-conflict and then to position itself as an arbitrator, as a, someone who is in a position of power to solve it. And by creating these micro-conflicts, you are basically the moving the so-called overtone window of the acceptance of the certain facts of how much aggression you can use, how much diplomatic pressure you can apply, what the other side is allowed to do in a diplomatic terms. So uh, this will be solved in a few days, but there will be more and more. And the final goal is to pressure the Serbian government to uh, install sanctions on Russian Federation, which is not in a Serbian interest, as your audience knows it's itself. 
Serbia is a very small country that has had a very troubling past, a lot of conflicts in the Balkans, and the last thing that we need at this point are enemies. Basically, the policy of Serbia isn't really pro-Russian. It's just uh, pro-Serbian in terms of a way that we want to cooperate with both Russian Federation and United States on equal terms. But the problem is that the arrogance of the globalist elites has reached to the point that they don't understand the very idea of the self-interest in diplomacy. The idea that us as a people can have our own interests in terms of our energy supply or food supply or our own territory seems arrogant to them because uh, being part of the rule-based order for them means only follow what we say. Yes, absolutely. I hope our audience is paying attention to what Tesha just said. So this, they do not want you to do this. They do not want, they want a unipolar order. They want control. They want, oh, if you've got farmers doing something, they don't want your farmers doing anything. They don't want you receive, being self-sufficient, producing your own fuel, running your own economy. They want all of these things controlled, right? And they want a unipolar order. And of course, what you're hearing from Vladimir Putin and others is, no, that's not the way we're moving forward. A number of, a lot of people in the United States are saying we need a multipolar order. We need to be self-sufficient. So what are the Serbian people? When you talk to, when you're on the streets, when you're talking to shopkeepers, when you're talking to people that run the stores or just out in the parks, what are you hearing from the Serbian people? How do they look upon this pressure from both NATO and from the European Union and Washington to impose sanctions on Russia? Well, they're very negative towards that idea. I believe that like 80% of the people are against sanctions. Why? Because as a nation, we have experienced the sanctions in the 90s. And we ourselves, regardless of our friendship with the Russian people, know how unfair the international sanctions are. And usually those sanctions, even if they really wanted to sanction Russia, they won't hit really their enemy, the Russian elites. It's usually the ordinary people who are suffering. So us being for sanctions would mean that we haven't learned anything from the 90s. And what our lesson from the 90s was that uh, all of the conflicts should be solved through diplomacy and not through war and through sanctions. And that's basically what the ordinary shopkeepers think. They think that there should be some kind of negotiations and there should be a di diplomatic peace deal uh, resolving the crisis in Ukraine. But the problem is that, as you know yourself, the deep state doesn't want it. You know, being anti-war at this point is, you know, a very extremist worldview in uh, the West. Right, right. Uh, a bunch of our viewers were asking us to cover the Serbian drone story. Uh, Serbia, of course, shooting down drone or drones, plural, not quite clear about that. So an unmanned aerial vehicle shot down in the town of Raska um, near, near, uh, near Kosovo. Uh, Serbian air defenses shooting down these drones. Apparently there's been more drones showing up. I want to, uh, uh, what we hear from um, the Serbian defense minister told reporters uh, just the other day that we did not use cannons, most of the modern electronic equipment. I, apparently they used like EMPs, right, um, to knock these drones down. What do you know about these drones? Why are they there? And uh, do you expect to see more of this? I have talked with uh, some uh, people from the military technical institutes in uh, Serbia, and they're taking the drone issue very seriously. For the last few years, Serbia has developed its own anti-drone system. But really, the game changer when it comes to drone was a, a conflict in Azerbaijan. That's what all of, all of the other regional countries have realized, that you must have drones, and the drones are at this point, as we see now with the war in Ukraine, a game changer on battlefield. So Serbia is putting a lot of money into the uh, research and development of new drones. And there was a statement by the Serbian president that these drones were not shut down by the foreign weapons, but by our own systems that have been developed here in Serbia. Unfortunately, when it comes to technical details, what type of drones they are, what systems were used to bring them down, uh, there is no information because government is keeping that secret for military reasons. So we don't know much about it. Those drones were probably released by the Albanian side on Kosovo as part of the hybrid warfare efforts. 
And I believe there will be more of such, but for now, we don't have much information. So we don't know specifically who made the drones. Do we know if there was NATO involvement in the drones? Are those questions still still hanging out there? I believe that the government knows, but that the government doesn't want to go out with that data at this point. Before we get you out of here, I just want to find out about how the Serbian people are doing right now. Uh, obviously, we see Europe, the rest of Europe, uh, suffering right now with high energy prices, uh, being told by their governments to turn down the heat. Um, it's getting cold. Uh, how are the Serbian people doing with their own energy this, uh, this coming winter? Well, so far, so good. I mean, like most of the European, I like all of the European countries, we had uh, big inflation, the prices are going up. But when it comes to the price of the energy of the gas and electricity and the heating, uh, prices are like 5% up or something like that. But the government has officially announced that they will hike the prices, but not for too much. Serbia has its own energy sources, it has its own deals with the Russian Federation regarding the gas supply. We have a privileged price of the gas. I believe that we will get through this winter without any kind of uh, blackouts or electricity cuts. It will, of course, have its price. You know, we will probably lose a billion or two billion dollars in debt that we will have to pay for that extra electricity and gas that we will need this year. But the situation here isn't that bad as it is in some of the other European countries. Tesha Teshinovic, uh, Serbian journalist joining us from Belgrade. We appreciate you joining us. Thank you for your uh, fantastic insights into what's happening there. We will have you back on real soon. Thank you so much, Tesha. Thanks a lot. A pleasure for being here. Thanks to Tesha and a lot of people in the chat saying, yeah, you know, Serbia has a lot of experience with NATO in 1999. They certainly remember the involvement, uh, not too keen on returning to that anytime soon. So our thanks to Tesha and we continue to watch what happens in Serbia to all of our Serbian viewers. Thank you so much and why it's so important to have on an independent journalists um, like Tesha and the other journalists that we feature here on the show. <clears throat> I just think outside of the mainstream media, you just are not going to see I was just reading some of the comments on our Haiti coverage over the past few days, and I was just touched and much love to all of you for your kind words. You're saying I, one person said I was watching the BBC all day and I didn't see one mention of what's going on in Haiti. Nothing. Not on CNN. Nowhere. So, you know, when you're able to support independent journalists, uh, we want to support as many independent journalists who are doing great work like Tesha on this show. That's what this show is all about, giving independent voices, cutting through all of the mainstream media garbage and lies to bring you the truth. That's our goal here on this show.